Welcome to our President's Day commemoration event. My name is Megan Radecki, and I'm proud to serve as the director at the Helen Stein Center for Presidential Studies. We are so glad to see you all here with us this evening, and you are in for a real treat with our guest, Matthew Costello from the White House Historical Association. A special thanks to our friends at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum and Library for partnering with us and helping to bring Matthew here today. So round of applause for our friends at the Ford. And if you haven't been over yet to see the Vice President's exhibit, we highly recommend it. The team and I were able to go actually a couple months ago, I think right before Christmas, but it's a great exhibit in addition to all the great um, features that they have on President Ford, but we encourage you to get over there sometime soon. Uh, I've been joking with people that it may seem sort of odd to celebrate President's Day by talking about President's passing. Um, but it's an angle that reveals a lot about our nation and humanity in general. Um, I still remember seeing the images of over 60,000 people lining the sidewalks right over here around the museum when President Ford's body laid in repose at the museum. I'm sure some of you were in those lines um, and some of you remember those images as well. But it does say a lot about who we are, how we relate to the presidents, um, not only when they're here, but also when they go. Um, as we continue in our theme of empowered citizenship, I think it's well worth contemplating the role of the president, the humans who hold that office, and the manner in which we, as citizens, relate to them both during and after their lives. Tonight's presentation and resulting Q&A will help us think more deeply about that unique relationship. Uh, now, as it is customary for us, it is my pleasure to introduce one of our favorite empowered citizens and a distinguished CLA fellow candidate, Quinton Proctor, who will share his leadership minute with us tonight. Quinton is a junior at GVSU and a first year fellow candidate with the Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy. He's studying political science and international relations, and he's active, actively involved in student senate, currently serving as the president. Quinton is looking forward to meeting new people, becoming more involved with the community and finding his voice as a leader. He loves music, enjoys taking walks, and is always looking to make new friends. Please join me in welcoming Quinton. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Quinton Proctor. I'm a Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy fellow candidate, and I'm also the student body president here at Grand Valley. But I actually didn't want to be the president at first. For context, following my re-election to the Student Senate last spring, I was gearing up to become this year's public relations officer. I'd spent months preparing for this role and had garnered the support of almost every student senator as the elections are held internally. I felt confident going into the night until both of our candidates for vice president dropped out of student senate entirely at the last minute. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, someone has to do this. And so I stepped up when nobody else did and I won the election. Um, and then a week later, the newly elected president also decided to leave entirely. <laughs> Needless to say, I was not exactly expecting to have this position. At this point, Student Senate began the school year on the brink. Of the 50 available seats, only about 12 were filled, only five of us had ever been on Student Senate before, and none of us had any leadership experience within the organization at all. Despite all this, I actually began to see these challenges as an opportunity. Because I stepped up, I was able to lead the charge on a complete reorganization and restructuring of the Student Senate before we came up with a brand new constitution and brand new bylaws. And now Student Senate is back and stronger than it was before. We're giving the students a say in who their student body president is for the first time ever. We're also ensuring that all of the different colleges at Grand Valley have representation. And we're also ensuring that both graduate and international students have representation on Student Senate as well, among so many other positive changes. This year at the Cook Leadership Academy, uh, we've discussed what it means to be an empowered citizen and why it's important. And I feel like I've exemplified this during my time at Grand Valley. Student Senate serves as the voice of the students to the university itself, and although our work tends to fly under the radar, I really believe that Student Senate plays a hugely important role in ensuring that the decisions being made benefit the students that go here. That's why I made that choice to run for vice president, and then eventually president, uh, to represent and to fight for students. And then because I stepped up when the time came, I'm now leaving such a unique and lasting legacy here at Grand Valley. While Student Senate is my thing, I'm really hoping that after tonight, all of you go back to your own things, and when the opportunity arises, that you step up and make a difference there as well. <laughs> 
As you're all sitting here in the audience tonight, listening to the leadership stories of the pre presidents of the United States, remember that they exemplified leadership at the very top, but that their lessons can still be applied to the challenges that we face today. So I encourage you all to take what you learn and bring it back with you. My name is Quentin Proctor, and I am a leader. Thank you. And it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Matthew Costello. Uh, Dr. Matthew Costello is the Chief Education Officer for the White House Historical Association and the Director of the David M. Rubenstein National Center for White House History. Matthew holds a doctorate and master's degree in American history from Marquette University. He's published two books, The Property of the Nation, George Washington's Tomb, Mount Vernon, and The Memory of the First President and Mourning the President's Legacy and Loss in American Culture. Please join me in welcoming Matthew Costello. Well, thank you, uh, Quentin, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I, I should say President Proctor. Uh, uh, it is very, uh, is very intimidating to be presenting on President's Day in front of a president, but I will do my best. And, uh, and before I begin tonight's talk, I'd like to first just express my gratitude for the hospitality I've received here, uh, beginning with uh, Brent Holmes, the associate director who invited me, uh, associate director of the Hauenstein Center, uh, for the invitation to speak with you all today. Uh, I've had a few interactions with Maddie Miller, who is their marketing media specialist, uh, helping record on Zoom, uh, which uh, was trickier than I thought it would be. And uh, we did uh, the podcast today, so thank you again, Maddie, for that. And of course, uh, the Hauenstein Center director, Megan Rydecki, who uh, has been wonderful uh, in greeting me and showing me around and telling me more about the programs here at this uh, fantastic university and institution. The origins of this book, uh, Mourning the President's Lost and Legacy in American Culture, started uh, with observations and conversations around the death and mourning period for President George H.W. Bush, who died on November 30th, 2018. Now this week-long process, spanning the United States, beginning in Houston, Texas, moving to Washington, D.C., back to Houston, and then on to College Station, where the Bush Library is for the final goodbye, uh, told us a lot about the political moment that we were living in. And what we argue throughout the book is that uh, presidential funerals, state funerals are not necessarily just about the people we've lost, but in fact, we can use these occasions as windows to understand the times in which we are moving through. Now, in my role as senior historian, I, did, I recall doing more press that week than any other time during my tenure in that position. Journalists and members of the media were eager to contextualize what exactly was about to transpire and how the current president, Donald J. Trump, would fit, or not, into these events, traditions, and ceremonies. Now, despite President Trump's many criticisms of the Bush family, he was very publicly amiable and hospitable to the Bush family, even offering them the use of Blair House, the president's guest house, during the state funeral in Washington, D.C. Over the next few days, I was struck by the media coverage and the frequency with which commentators discussed Bush's military service and combat record, his long career in public service, and his leadership style and character. They stressed his decency, his civility. He was considered a statesman and for having the ability to work across the aisle. Now, to be fair, George H.W. Bush was all of these things, but the contrast was particularly striking with the current president. President Trump and First Lady Melania Trump attended the state funeral in Washington, but he was not asked to deliver a eulogy for the former president. Instead, presidential biographer John Meacham, Brian Mulroney, former Prime Minister of Canada, Alan Simpson, the former Senator uh, from Wyoming, and George W. Bush, son and former president, delivered the tributes. Now, naturally, there was some curiosity about sitting presidents being invited to funerals, but not being asked to speak, which then we had to research. Gerald Ford had both Bushes speak in Washington in 2007. Ronald Reagan had the same in 2004. And President Clinton eulogized Richard Nixon in 
at the Nixon Library in 1994. The last occasion involved Richard Nixon himself, who was president at the time when his predecessor, Lyndon Johnson, died in 1973. President Nixon attended the funeral services in Washington, but did not deliver a eulogy. So this research demonstrated that while this was a relatively new precedent, only decades in the making, after a series of former Republican presidents asked the sitting president, also a Republican, to deliver remarks. Still, this became more of the same political fodder about President Trump and the Bush family. Now, as we watched this unfold, my colleague, Lindsey Travinsky, and I wondered if we were witnessing, participating in, and contributing to a new phenomenon. How have Americans historically mourned their leaders? How does partisanship and politics of the moment factor into these processes? How were these mourning rituals invented, shared, reinforced, and if need be, discarded? It became clear that this was a great opportunity to seek input and insight from fellow historians and scholars of the presidency. Lindsay was now a senior fellow at SMU's Center for Presidential History, and I was still with the White House Historical Association. Thus, we proposed a partnership between these entities to produce an edited volume of essays that would explore presidential mourning traditions and their evolution over time. How different groups of Americans mourned at that time and beyond. And ultimately, how these events shape the longer process of legacy making. Now the volume covers some of the most well-known presidents, such as George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Andrew Jackson, Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, John F. Kennedy, and Ronald Reagan, as well as some lesser known, such as Zachary Taylor, Andrew Johnson, and Herbert Hoover. As I mentioned, George H.W. Bush rounds out the book as his passing was the most recent and the inspiration for the project. Now, the other caveat I will add is that with this study, while all authors took a similar approach in examining a president's rise to office and passing, we took remarkably different approaches to the concept of legacy. Some focused on how historians have talked about presidents and how those interpretations have evolved and changed over time. Others used monuments and statues to understand wider shifts in the public consciousness and how that impacted the memory landscape. Some examined material culture and how Americans collected and displayed mementos related to these figures. And others elevated the perspectives of Americans either excluded from the story or often left on the margins, including enslaved and free African Americans, women, working class whites, and immigrants. The blending of these experiences and how different people and groups express grief for a deceased president offer us a window to explore how varied these responses were, depending not only on the president in question, but also the people themselves. Now our story begins, at least our story of understanding presidential mourning, well, we have to start with a president dying, unfortunately. Uh, and it's going to be George Washington, who set so many different precedents as the first president of the United States. He also, too, sets a precedent as a former president to be the first deceased. George Washington retires from the presidency in 1797. He retires to Mount Vernon for a short-lived retirement. And, uh, and he even goes ahead and he creates a new will in the summer of 1799. On December 12th, he rides out across his estate to oversee some of the work and is caught uh, in what appears to be wintry weather. There's snow, there's a mix, a wintry mix of rain and snow and sleet. And he returns to the main plantation house for dinner. The next day he wakes up and he does the same, but he has a terribly sore throat. In fact, it's bothering him so much that by the evening, he is unable to read newspapers to his family after dinner and so he orders his secretary, Tobias Lear, to do it for him. In the early morning hours of December 14th, he wakes up, and he wakes his wife up, Martha, and he's struggling to breathe. He's still having intense pain, and she immediately sends for Dr. James Craig, who is George Washington's longtime physician. Uh, she calls George Rawlings, who is one of the overseers at Mount Vernon, and he comes and he administers the first bleeding for George Washington, 
uh, there were a series of bleedings that were applied to Washington to try to amend his condition. Uh, and ultimately he was bleed, he, he was bled of about 80 to 85 ounces of blood, uh, which today would be a roughly five, five-ish pints or units of blood. Uh, but this was the medical treatment of the time. Uh, these were the techniques. Uh, and it wasn't just James Craig, but also two additional doctors were invited to try to revive Washington and restore his condition. Ultimately, Washington dies around 10.30 p.m. on December 14, 1799. He lays out instructions in his will about the desire to be buried in what he calls the old tomb. He is laid out in the new room, uh, which today, if you go to Mount Vernon, uh, this is what often people have thought is the dining room space to the north. They called it the new room in Washington's time. And he's instructed to be laid out for three days to ensure that he has indeed expired. Uh, Washington, like many people at that time, were terrified of the idea of being buried alive, uh, which it did sometimes happen. Uh, so they insisted, make sure I am truly dead. And there's a story many years later that Dr. William Thornton, who was the first architect of the United States Capitol building, he drew the original plans. He arrived late to Mount Vernon to try to save Washington's life, and he suggested a method to, uh, to the following, to revive Washington by giving him a tracheotomy, warming his body with blankets, and a transfusion of lamb's blood. Now, this never actually happened, thankfully, but it is a good reminder of how Thornton, like many Americans, were willing to try something so desperate to save Washington. How would the United States endure? Washington had been there since the beginning, leading the Americans to victory over the British during the Revolutionary War. He had answered the call to chair the Constitutional Convention. He had served as the first president of the United States. He invented innumerable presidents in that office and traditions along the way. And now he was gone. In his will, Washington asked for a private funeral and to be interred in the family tomb in, in I quote, in a private manner without parade or funeral oration. This wish was largely ignored, both by his family and the American public. Hundreds of people descended upon Mount Vernon to pay their respects and visit the widowed Martha Washington. Veterans, members of the Freemasonry, musicians, neighbors, citizens, enslaved people at Mount Vernon were all present and participated in the event that led to Washington's entombment. Americans held mock funerals for Washington across the United States between his death in December and what was a national day of celebration, Washington's birthday, February 22, 1800. One scholar, uh, Gerald Kaler, tabulated more than 400 public funeral events for Washington took place across the country at that time. So despite his wishes for what he called a private uh, without pomp, without parade, without oration, this wish was largely ignored. Now this template becomes the model for the sitting president of the United States when William Henry Harrison passed in 1841. Before then, all the former presidents had passed in private homes or at their plantations. Funeral arrangements were handled by family and much of the mourning was performed by family, friends, and nearby locals. The national collective mourning was much more muted. As some of these men, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe, lived and contributed to the development of party politics, and in turn, they themselves were products of politicalization. With Harrison and Zachary Taylor, both presidents received what we would consider the forerunner of a state funeral today. They both had a funeral service at the White House. Congress issued resolutions on how to instruct citizens to mourn and administration officials took the lead in planning and executing the funeral procession and entombment at Congressional Cemetery. Now, because both of these men died uh, at difficult times of the year to transport the remains home, they were temporarily entombed in what was called the public vault at Congressional Cemetery and only moved later. Now, Abraham Lincoln's state funeral followed this model, but with some new additions, and I think in some key ways, better resemble what we would think of today as the modern presidential state funeral. Lincoln was the first president to lay in state in the Capitol Rotunda. 
There were new forms of communication, such as the telegraph, to disseminate the information of Lincoln's passing, and also the whereabouts of his body, uh, which became a topic of fascination for Americans in April and May 1865. And finally, he was embalmed. This was the new scientific evolution and technology that came out of the massive amounts of death and casualties of the Civil War. As that bodies would be collected, they could be embalmed, and they could be sent home to slow decomposition, and Lincoln received the same treatment as many of these soldiers. And in turn, members of his cabinet, military officials, union officers, were able to construct an elaborate funeral train procession back to Springfield, Illinois. And throughout that 1600 mile journey through seven states, stopping in 13 different places, Lincoln was taken off the train and put in repose in various government buildings. So Americans could pay their respects and say goodbye to the slain commander in chief. Now it is worth noting that while Lincoln today is often regarded as, as one of the greatest if not the greatest president in American history, that is not how many Americans felt in 1865. As a result, his mourning process is extremely sectional and politicized. And as Martha Hodes in the volume posits in her chapter, there were a considerable number of people that either celebrated Lincoln's death or considered it merely a casualty of war. For African Americans, Lincoln's assassination meant something entirely different. It sparked fears about losing the gains produced by the war. Many wondered what Reconstruction would look like under his successor, Andrew Johnson, and some even speculated that perhaps black Americans, if the 13th Amendment wasn't ratified, could be possibly re-enslaved. Now my chapter explores the reaction to the passing of former President Theodore Roosevelt in 1919 and the immediate efforts to elevate him into the pantheon of national heroes. Most people are surprised to learn sort of that jump uh, when you look at the faces on Mount Rushmore, how quickly Roosevelt was able to join that pantheon of heroes. You have Washington, you have Jefferson, you have Lincoln, and Roosevelt dies in 1919, and they start construction in the late 1920s. So in about 10 years time, it's a pretty remarkable elevation of Roosevelt up to that platform with those other key figures. Now this dialogue is particularly fascinating as Roosevelt left office in 1909, supporting his Republican successor, William Howard Taft, only to run against him in 1912 and then buck his own party. Roosevelt's decision to run as the progressive candidate siphoned votes away from Taft, ultimately handing the presidency to Democrat Woodrow Wilson. Roosevelt did not go quietly into the night uh, though he rarely did anything quietly, he remained a political and social force throughout the decade. And there was even talk of him returning into the folds of the Republican Party as a potential presidential candidate in 1920. However, his death on January 6, 1919, intervened, though I think Roosevelt would have welcomed the opportunity. Uh, he later admits in life that one of his regrets is saying that he would only serve one term in the White House. How quickly Republicans and conservatives forgot about 1912. Additionally, they took the lead in commemorating and celebrating Roosevelt, realigning the former president with core Republican principles and policies, and downplaying his what they sometimes called his regrettable flame with progressivism. That said, I do think Roosevelt's progressive streak made him somewhat more palatable to more people. Women, African Americans, immigrants, Jewish Americans, and others found something relatable uh, to President Roosevelt. Roosevelt's mourning period is nonetheless fascinating. He was in fact offered a state funeral by the Department of War as a colonel, but the family declined to keep Roosevelt's wishes for a simple service and burial in Oyster Bay, New York. The event attracted members of Congress, visiting dignitaries, and condolences from heads of state and monarchs around the world. Fortunately for him, President Wilson was abroad negotiating the Treaty of Versailles, so he sent Vice President Thomas Marshall in his place, avoiding any possible awkwardness as Roosevelt consistently and frequently criticized Wilson's policies. On Roosevelt's Day of National Remembrance, a group of 75 suffragists marched outside the White House 
and attempted to burn a Woodrow Wilson effigy. Though not an official tribute, I believe Roosevelt would have been delighted by the spectacle. <laughs> now, I think up to this point in time, there's still a key distinction here between the passing of a sitting president of the United States and a former president of the United States. But we're starting to see those lines blur more and more, especially with Roosevelt. Now, those that passed while in office, James A. Garfield, William McKinley, Warren G. Harding, Franklin D. Roosevelt, all followed the Lincoln model, but with very different results in terms of legacy. Garfield's presidency was short-lived, and he lingered for months after being shot. Uh, it kind of kept him in this, uh, it kept the American people really under this degree of uncertainty about what was happening with the president's health. Would he live? Would he die? And, uh, and I will say, though, that there has been a great recent biography by C.W. Goodyear uh, that I would highly recommend about President Garfield that looks beyond him, aside simply from his legacy of, well, he was assassinated. Uh, there's a lot more to that story. I'd highly recommend that book. McKinley was quickly overshadowed by the boisterous Theodore Roosevelt. There's something to be said about the person who comes after you. And I think Roosevelt had that appeal, that popularity, and uh, he quickly overshadows William McKinley, even though in many regards he's carrying on many of McKinley's policies and approaches uh, and even efforts, say, in places like the Philippines, Cuba, Guam. Uh, he continues a lot of the McKinley administration policies, um, but there's a lot of disparity there between who gets credit for what and, uh, and Roosevelt is overshadowed his predecessor. The scandals of the Warren G. Harding administration seemed to be quickly forgotten as Calvin Coolidge moved to quickly turn the page on the Harding presidency. Now, in fairness to Coolidge, this was to restore public trust and integrity to the person who was in the office. Sound familiar? Um, we talk a lot about Gerald Ford here and, I, uh, and, and also at the, at the Ford Museum. And I was just, I kept being struck by that those words, uh, courage, integrity. And, uh, and so turning the page on a previous administration, regardless of how that administration ends, uh, is key. It's key to this process of legacy making. And then finally, with Franklin D. Roosevelt's death, this marked another turn in how Americans grieved collectively as a people. Now, Keep in mind, Franklin Roosevelt had been president for 12 years up to this point in time. In fact, uh, there are journalists who are interviewing Americans about this entire experience and how they're feeling. And uh, you keep hearing the same sentiment. I don't, I, I, Franklin Roosevelt's the only president I know, the only president I knew. Uh, well, he had been in office for 12 years. So that was a big part of why many Americans only knew Franklin Roosevelt as president. Uh, but also keep in mind that uh, this, this is also part of Roosevelt's outreach to Amer the American people. Now, he had guided the country through the Great Depression and the Second World War. He created new agencies and programs designed to put citizens back to work and later supported new measures to safeguard the most vulnerable. Again, technology transformed this relationship between the president and citizen in that Americans came to know FDR much more personally through the radio. As Americans gathered around their radio sets in their homes, his 30 fireside chats provided much needed hope and optimism during a dark time in American and world history. As a result, the, the American populace was devastated by Roosevelt's death. For black Americans, FDR's death was especially painful. Roosevelt's New Deal programs, while sometimes ineffective because of local administrators' prejudices and discriminatory practices, nonetheless had provided much needed assistance and additional opportunities for employment for black communities. Mindful of the ongoing war effort and the need to conserve resources, FDR had gone ahead and planned for a sim simple funeral service at the White House, and he declined to lay in state at the Capitol Rotunda. Instead, he was transported by Kaysen to the train station and then on to his beloved Hyde Park for burial. Just a few years earlier, Roosevelt had created the first presidential library at his estate with the intent to turn it and all documents and artifacts from his administration over to the federal government. 
This became the forerunner of the modern presidential library system under the National Archives, and his successors followed suit, most of them anyway. Some also followed Roosevelt's lead in deciding to be buried at their presidential libraries, uh, which of course we have Gerald Ford here at the Ford Museum, and most recently with George H.W. Bush at his presidential library in College Station. Now, President Kennedy's televised funeral seared a number of images into our national consciousness. The news of the assassination on November 22, 1963, stopped Americans in their tracks, wherever they were. Families and strangers gathered around televisions to watch the nonstop media coverage. First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy requested that her husband's state funeral closely follow that of another slain president, Abraham Lincoln. And, and we know uh, the, uh, the chief usher at that time, uh, J.B. West, records that once they got word about what Mrs. Kennedy wanted, they were left scrambling uh, to look at different resources to see what Lincoln's funeral looked like in the White House so they could assemble this by the time the president's body reached Washington, D.C. Some 90 to 95 percent of American households that had televisions at the time tuned in to watch the funeral procession and interment at Arlington National Cemetery. But of course, the most memorable moment came when John Jr. saluted his father's casket outside St. Matthew's Cathedral. It was also John Jr.'s birthday. In her chapter on Kennedy, Sharon Conrad Davis highlights, again, a different group of Americans and how they grieved the loss of Kennedy but also uh, how they came to view Kennedy's death over time. And she highlights how black Americans remembered Kennedy and elevated him exclusively as a martyr for the cause of civil rights. The memory of JFK was powerful and persuasive, and Lyndon Johnson invoked the president frequently to pressure Congress to pass legislation on a number of different things, but in particular, civil rights. Within black households, uh, Sharon details how uh, many black Americans were putting up Trinity displays. Uh, think of it as sort of the Trinity of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, same concept, but with historical figures or cultural figures of importance. And oftentimes in black households, you would see Abraham Lincoln, you might see Jesus, you might see Martin Luther King Jr. down the road, but Kennedy had joined that Trinity and that there were many black Americans who were convinced that he had been killed by a white supremacist for standing up for African Americans and speaking out for civil rights. Now, despite the findings of the Warren Commission and uh, the debunking of many of these conspiracy theories, Sharon noted that many uh, African Americans even today are still suspicious of uh, the government's explanation of Kennedy's death. Now, the last two presidents in the volume, Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, both departed the American political scene under very different circumstances. Reagan had served two terms and then retired from public life after his diagnosis of Alzheimer's. President Bush lost a tough re-election campaign, but went on to have a fairly prolific post-presidential life, raising awareness for a variety of causes, both with former First Lady Barbara Bush and uh, a number of the former presidents. Reagan's farewell really began uh, not January 20th, 1989, but instead on November 5th, 1994, when he released a letter to the American people sharing that he had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Quoting from President Reagan's letter, upon learning this news, Nancy and I had to decide whether as private citizens we would keep this a private matter or whether we would make this news known in a public way. In the past, Nancy suffered from breast cancer and I had my cancer surgeries. We found through our open disclosures we were able to raise public awareness. We were happy that as a result, many more people underwent testing. They were treated in early stages and able to return to normal, healthy lives. So now we feel it is important to share it with you. In opening our hearts, we hope this might promote greater awareness of this condition. Perhaps we'll encourage a clearer understanding of the individuals and families who are affected by it. For the next 10 years, the Reagan family and 
in particular Nancy Reagan, prepared for the final public goodbye, which came in June 2004. Now, Mrs. Reagan had played a pivotal role in carefully orchestrating and coordinating a week-long schedule of events, beginning first at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library in Simi Valley, then across the country at Washington, D.C. for a state funeral at National Cathedral, and then back to California for services and burial at the Reagan Presidential Library. This time, Americans could watch the events online. Another leap forward in technology and communications that connected more people across the country and around the world with the events and the mourning processes in real time. George H.W. Bush had a very similar uh, slate of presidential uh, funeral ceremonies moving from Texas to D.C. and back, though Bush 41 had two unique elements, one new and one a bit of a throwback. The new component this time was social media. And the social media star was Sully. Sully was the service dog uh, who had been with uh, George H.W. Bush. And when this picture was posted online, uh, it went viral. And uh, if you go on Instagram today, I think Sully still has about 240,000 followers, which is pretty remarkable for a dog. Um, but this photo uh, was everywhere. And, uh, and again, another way to reach people uh, in a moment of grief that, you know, 10 years earlier, 20 years earlier, Americans didn't have this kind of access, uh, really sort of a front row seat uh, to what was happening in terms of the president's remains and his whereabouts and what was happening behind the scenes. Now the throwback was Bush's decision to include a train in his farewell. Now trains had sort of gone uh, out of fashion, you know, um, a lot of presidents and former presidents, they had their remains moved from Washington DC to wherever they wanted to be buried uh, throughout the 19th century. And then that continues all the way up to, um, I believe either Hoover or Eisenhower is sort of the last one to have a train component in the 1960s. Uh, but then up to that point in time, really Air Force One has replaced presidential, uh, long distance presidential transport. And they're using more Air Force planes for these types of missions. And so George H.W. Bush loved trains. He grew up as a kid loving trains. And so he came up with this idea himself, and it's in the chapter, where he was essentially selling his staff on the idea of we should ask Union Pacific if they will sponsor a train for my funeral. And uh, he's telling his staff about it and he thinks it's so great. Well, we can have family and friends on the train and we'll serve lunch and we can, you know, it'll be fun. And, and uh, his, uh, somebody says to him, well, you know, you, know, you won't be having lunch. <laughs> and, he, and, uh, and of course, President Bush quips, well, yeah, but I'll be there. And, uh, and so again, I think it's a great example of these ceremonies not just being about the individual in question, but oftentimes they lend themselves to others uh, for their own moments of grief, and then also trying to understand this wider sense of collective grief for a passing leader. And uh, they, they kept the train at the Bush Library, and now uh, they are constructing a pavilion to keep that train there and it will be part of the permanent museum down in College Station. So if you find yourself down there, uh, you'll, you'll be able to see it. So what are some of the key takeaways from this volume that uh, I hope that maybe this presentation touched on, but also maybe we can get into a little bit more with our Q&A and our moderated conversation. Traditions associated with presidential and state funerals evolved over time, and presidents today are guided by these precedents, but they are not bound by them. If a president decided that they didn't want to have a state funeral in Washington, D.C., that is their prerogative. In fact, there's been a few presidents, a few modern presidents that have done that. Harry Truman uh, elected to not have a funeral in Washington, D.C., um, and this for a number of reasons, but he did everything at the Truman Library in Independence uh, and, and their local church. Uh, a big part of it was uh, Bess Truman's health. You know, he was really concerned about her having to travel 
And so he decided to keep everything in independence. Also, he knew that his wife didn't really like Washington, D.C. So, um, and Harry Truman loved his wife dearly. And so he really made these decisions um, to, to keep it as, as independence focused as possible. Uh, same with Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon uh, opted to not have a state funeral in Washington, D.C. And instead, uh, all of the services were performed in Yorba Linda at the Nixon Boyhood Home and then Nixon Library. Advancements in travel, communications, and technology have made the morning experience more accessible to Americans and people around the world. You know, this is a pretty far cry from George Washington's passing in 1799, and you have a crowd of several hundred people who just sort of force their way onto the grounds to be part of the funeral, and then you have mock funerals that are spontaneously done, but then beyond that, presidential mourning is very sporadic. It can be very localized. It can be very sectional in nature. And so this idea of a national sense of mourning really doesn't come around until, uh, I would say, the 20th century. Uh, and it takes a few prominent presidents passing away for more and more Americans to see these occasions as opportunities to talk about the ideals that we share as opposed to the differences that we perceive between us. And then finally, uh, there are three key factors that you note throughout the volume when we're talking about presidential legacy, uh, talking about political party or affiliation. So how does partisanship shape this idea of legacy? Uh, the first family. Uh, there are a number of different chapters in the book that talk about the influence and impact of first ladies, but also the children of former presidents. And what roles do they play in shaping legacy? And then finally, uh, race. Uh, there were a number of different chapters that focus specifically on how different groups of Americans perceived presidents, perceived the presidency, and also how they grieved very differently. Uh, one of the most powerful chapters in the book is about Thomas Jefferson. And it's actually told from a very different perspective. Uh, it's told by one of the Sally Hemings descendants, who has a very different perspective and understanding of what Jefferson's death meant for the enslaved community at Monticello. And if you don't know the end of that story, Jefferson was in debt and his white family sold uh, a lot of the enslaved people, more than 200 enslaved people at Monticello to pay off his debts. And this is where we see the splintering of families. And so Jefferson's death means something very differently to people at that time, white Americans who are celebrating the Declaration of Independence versus enslaved people who see this as Jefferson's death could actually mean family separation, could mean selling off. And I think probably one of the, it's not up here necessarily uh, on the bullet points, but I think one of the things that I learned in my role as editor of this volume is that I don't necessarily agree with everything in the volume, but I think that's sort of the point. You know, there are things that we can all identify with, uh, we can all come to a consensus around, and there are things that we can all appreciate. There's also different perspectives to consider. And I think it's important to take those into account, to talk through them, and ultimately to understand that when you're looking at all these different leaders, I mean, they stepped into this office and um, well, the office never really leaves them when they leave. Uh, and I think that's especially apparent now with former presidents living longer and longer and longer. And, uh, you know, we're going to have to start talking about things like post-presidential life. Uh, so not just about the office and when they were in office. What did they do beyond it? How did they use the power of the office beyond the elected office itself? And so with that, uh, I thank you for, uh, for listening. And uh, we can now move to our moderated conversation. Thank you, first of all, for sharing this book and this work with all of us. Um, friendly reminder that copies of this will be for sale after the lecture. And if um, you have a moment, you might get a chance to talk with Matthew about it as well. Um, let's just jump in. One of your key takeaways was around traditions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure I'm probably stealing someone's question, but there's probably a lot of folks here thinking about President Carter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you talked a little bit about... Um, you know, it comes to traditions, what they might choose, but also how do we sort of analyze life after the presidency, what people do that. 
Give us your thoughts about um, President Carter. Um, mm -hmm. We all know, I think he's a year out now from being in hospice and um, sadly lost his wife a couple months ago. Thoughts about how he may be memorialized and things you might expect. So uh, I used to think that a Carter State funeral would be very reflective of Jimmy Carter, the man, who has always been uh, very humble, uh, very down to earth. I mean, this is sort of the persona, the perception that we have of President Carter. He's from Plains. He's very relatable. And uh, it, it almost gets to a point where you kind of forget that he was president, right? And so, uh, and in fact, everybody keeps, and I've heard a number of different people even say this while I've been here, he has to be the most successful post-presidential president. And uh, I started thinking, I wonder how Jimmy Carter would feel about that. Like if they said, well, you know, you, people know you because you had a great post-presidency. Mm -hmm. You know, he may not like that characterization because at the same time, he might see it as, well, I was president of the United States and I think my administration did some pretty good things. And yet I've sort of been typecast as this very successful post-presidency president. And so I thought that, you know, a Carter State funeral would actually be something rather simple. Maybe it would be even just in planes. Uh, but I, it sounds like that they are preparing more for a traditional state funeral for Carter, similar along the lines of, say, a George H.W. Bush. Mm -hmm. So multiple places, probably in Plains, uh, probably in Washington, D.C. And so to me, that's very fascinating because, you know, Carter has lived longer than any other president. He's now, you know, sat in, he's even participated in, I know he... He gave the eulogy at President Ford's uh, service here, right, in Grand Rapids. So he's been witness. I mean, he's participated in these things himself. And it sounds like he's, he's had a, a change of heart. And so I find that really interesting because it, to me, it almost seems to suggest that Carter wants people to, hey, you know, I was president of the United States too. You know, it wasn't just everything you did after 1981 was remarkable. Um, and so it's very interesting to see him take that position. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll have to wait and see until the actual day what it looks like. But I think that even then, you know, those decisions, they tell us a lot about how that person wants to be remembered, right? Because you know, they're typically making those decisions or they made those decisions ahead of time. And so really, you know, they are the screenwriter, the producer, the director, for this performance. Thank you. Um, in your essay about Teddy Roosevelt, um, I was struck by a certain example that you gave about when he, in some sense or another, dishonorably discharged um, a group of African-American um, uh, military individuals um, after an incident that happened. And there was a statement in which a reporter had said that um, Teddy Roosevelt was a great figure in American life, but not a great man. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, with your study of the presidents, how do you personally or how should we as a nation reconcile the fruits of a presidency mm -hmm. with their individual character? It's an excellent question. Um, you know, with Roosevelt, uh, you know, obviously there's, there's many examples of him either writing or saying, you know, things that we would consider racist today, right? About African-Americans, about Native Americans, about Asian Americans. And at the same time, you know, he invites Booker T. Washington to the White House to have dinner and then creates sort of a fire, a political firestorm over that act. And Roosevelt is stunned by that, that people would act with such venom about this idea. And, and so it's sort of like, you know, how do we reconcile these two things? Well, I think one, you know, to take a president out of con the context of the times that they live in, you know, it, it, I think it's easy to pass judgment when you don't consider the entire picture, right? And so you have to take the context of the times, the person, uh, you know, these were not uncommon beliefs, sadly, at the, at the time either. And so, you know, the idea that Roosevelt was a great figure, but he wasn't a great man, uh, I think he probably would have been pretty annoyed by that comment, but what that person was getting at was they were referencing uh, Roosevelt's decision to discharge 
I think it was about 160 African Americans in te uh, from Texas in the Brownsville riots. And even though their white officers had vouched for them, there had been an investigation, um, you know, Roosevelt doesn't change his mind. Uh, but, you know, again, that was, you know, one of Roosevelt's weaknesses as a leader is that he would make a decision. And even if it came to light that it was a mistake or, he, you know, he should walk it back, you know, he stuck to it. And so that was just sort of the personality that you were dealing with. Sure. So to piggyback on that a little bit, um, a couple of the essayists point to the fact that our views of people tend to change over time based on the environment that we live in, the cultural norms of the day, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So as a presidential historian, do you believe, um, or would you make recommendations about how often as we move forward that we should be revisiting study of the past and of mm -hmm. these presidents? Because conceivably 20 years from now, we may be living in a very different world and we may look at Teddy Roosevelt and have new things to discover, mm -hmm. new things to say about his presidency. So um, I guess when it comes to the, the cadence of which we, we reflect back, do mm -hmm. you have thoughts about what makes sense? How often should we do that? What more can we learn? Yeah, I mean, so uh, there's a couple of different things. I think we're always finding new evidence, right? There's always new material to be discovered. And so I, I was talking to a few different people uh, during the reception and some of these figures, you know, you're talking about the Lincolns, the Kennedys, the TRs. I mean, these individuals have, you know, tens of thousands of books written about them. So what are you really saying that's new or what is the original take? Sometimes it's because there's new evidence. Uh, sometimes there's new research. But oftentimes, you know, I think as long as you have a compelling figure the time is always ripe to revisit that figure. And because whatever moment we're living in, whatever crisis we're facing, whatever issues that are coming up, chances are we've experienced it in some form previously. And so history can always be a good compass to understanding what direction we you know, could lay ahead, uh, what's the trajectory of these things. And uh, you know, I think the presidency can be used as a vehicle for that because you know, so many people know the presidents, they know American history around the presidents, so why not add more context to that? Why not add more color to that? And by creating a more comprehensive understanding of the past, I think it ultimately prepares us for the present and for the future. So I have one more question and then we will turn it to the audience. So if you are thinking of some things, uh, get your hands ready and we'll have a couple mic runners who can come down and grab your question. Um, but speaking to the future, um, clearly you're part of the White House Historical Association mm -hmm. and not the Fortune Tellers Association. But I'm going to ask <laughs> you to project out um, if, if you could think about what the world might look like in 20 years and reflect back on these times during the Trump-Biden era. Mm -hmm. What kinds of things do you think we'll be remembering? What kinds of things do you think will be noteworthy based mm. on the presidencies that we've recently experienced? So I'll start with historians are terrible at predicting the future. <laughs> so don't hold me to any of this. Fair. Um, you know, studying how people mourned, how Americans mourn presidents, I felt like in a lot of the chapters, I found more and more divisiveness and disunity than I expected. I mean, I, I don't know if it's sort of the nostalgia of American history that you just sort of assume that there, there are these moments that where we pull together as a nation and you kind of assume that the passing of a president is one of those times. But what you find is that it really varied. I mean, it, it depended on a number of different factors. And so you walk, then you sort of turn from that and you look at today and you're like, well, what does this mean? Well, you know, I think with the H.W. Bush example, a big part of that, and you can hear it in the rhetoric talking about Bush, I think a lot of it is juxtaposition with Trump. Uh, so talking about service to your country, talking about combat, talking about uh, a statesman, uh, civility, decency. I mean, they keep using these words over and over and over. And again, it's not that Bush wasn't any of those things, but it felt like it was more directed at the current occupant. And so 
moving forward, what are we gonna see? Well, you know, I felt like the most recent presidential funerals, talking about Ronald Reagan, Gerald Ford, um, you know, those two in particular, I felt like those much more had the feel of people uniting to pay respects to a leader that was gone, who they may or may not have agreed with, but they honored their service, and uh, they believed that these men had done all they can, and they had done what they believed was right for their country. Is that what is that going to look like in twenty years? I don't know. Um, you know, we have uh, a very interesting presidential race. I say heating up, uh, but it seems like it's been sort of cast in stone for a while. Um, you know, you're seeing more and more polls about how more and more Americans do not want to see this, this matchup. Uh, so what is, that, what is that telling us? Is it about the candidates? Is it about our views of the presidency? Is it about who we all think or we all agree should and should not be in the office? Or is the idea of the office changed and we all see it differently? I don't know. Um, I think the election results are going to tell us a lot about what we envision for the presidency and, uh, and you know, who should be fit to serve in that office. So what's going to happen in 20 years? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I do think that state funerals will continue. I would imagine there'll be some changes and some evolutions, again, in terms of technology, communications, um, but I mean, like if you're asking like, you know, would President Trump want a state funeral? Yes, I believe he would. Uh, you know, and I think Joe Biden would probably want a state funeral as well. Uh, that's just become the norm now. So until somebody breaks that pattern, I think that tradition will continue to go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, with that, as promised, we're ready for some questions from the audience. Does anyone have a question? I have a question about the separation of church and state and presidential funerals. So how has the separation of church and state affected presidential funerals in the past and currently? Hmm. Uh, well, that's a great question. Uh, there's been a number of presidents who have opted to do uh, sort of like their own family or public services at perhaps their local churches or nearby where they desire to be buried. And then they've also done a state funeral service at National Cathedral. Now, a national cathedral is, uh, I think, considered uh, Episcopalian, but really it's sort of a non-denominational uh, type church as well. So uh, it doesn't really necessarily matter the specific denomination of the president. Uh, they're pretty accommodating uh, in that regard. And I think the idea, I mean, really sort of the premise behind the national cathedral was for this to be a place of worship for all people. And so that environment, I think, has become very welcoming uh, for anybody that wants to do a state funeral in Washington, D.C. And then uh, when you're doing funerals elsewhere, typically it is either the family's church or a church where they got married or a church that they still attended. Uh, you know, with Theodore Roosevelt, that, that uh, Christ Church is still there in Oyster Bay. You can go visit it today. Uh, and they have the pew where Roosevelt and his family used to sit. And, uh, and so... You, you usually typically see a mix of sort of local sites and then uh, the National Cathedral site as well. Johnson's was a little bit different. He had his uh, at, I think, Christ Church in Washington. But for the most part, it's been National Cathedral. I think it's interesting that you focused on top tier, easily remembered and easily recognized names. I'm far more interested in Grant and LBJ and Eisenhower, especially mm -hmm. Grant and Eisenhower, since one was the commander of the United States Army for the Civil War, and the other one was the Supreme Commander in World War II. They would have, I think, have had much different impact in their, in their commemoration and memory of their death, especially um, Grant, because he, at the time, both sides of the conflict respected and, and honored him. And I would have thought that that would have been a very interesting funeral. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to hear you speak just a little bit about those, if you could. Sure. So uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, if it were up to us, we would have done probably 20 or 30 chapters. But, uh, you know, it's the problem of doing an edited volume. Uh, and anytime anybody asks me about other presidents, I say, second edition. Um, 
so hopefully, uh, you know, there's enough momentum. Everybody goes out. You get rid of all those pesky first editions. And then uh, I can go back to UVA Press and I can say, you know what, we need to add Ulysses S. Grant to this. And I think in hindsight, um, I think Grant would have been a great choice. Uh, we included, um, you know, Zachary Taylor, Andrew Johnson, and Herbert Hoover. And the Herbert Hoover chapter is particularly fascinating because he really, he really works to rehabilitate his image. Uh, and he's out of office for about 30 years. And he accomplishes quite a, quite a bit that most people don't even realize. But to your original question, uh, so we're talking about Grant, Eisenhower, LBJ. All those would be fantastic chapters. Um, Grant has seen a revival, especially from historians uh, in the last 20 years. Um, from what I recall about his funeral in New York, I mean, this was a massive event. Um, and I think to your point, it brought, you know, it wasn't just in New York for former Union soldiers, but there were also former Confederates participating in the funeral procession. Uh, and then, of course, they build that massive mausoleum and tomb for him in Riverside Park which I think is either it's still the largest mausoleum in North America or one of the largest. Um, and so, I mean, it's, it's very striking on the horizon. And at the same time, now that I'm thinking about it, you know, Lyndon Johnson's presidential library is also, uh, you know, very large, right? Um, and so, you know, those, and, uh, and uh, Eisenhower, you know, I think about from the Washington DC perspective, there was all this, uh, chatter and controversy over the Eisenhower Memorial in Washington, D.C., and they finally got that settled and the design. And um, But I mean, talk about like, if, if you want to talk about the American story, I mean, it's Dwight Eisenhower, you know, uh, born in Texas, grown up in Kansas. And uh, he always kind of described himself as like a Kansas farm boy. And elevating you know to the upper tiers of the american military supreme allied commander um and he yeah he would be an excellent addition um but as far as uh he, he, you know eisenhower passes in 1969 he follows a lot of the same state tradition uh state funeral traditions at the time um one of the things i love about eisenhower's is that he wants to be buried in a, uh, you know, basically a standard U.S. Army casket, uh, which is like an $80 casket. Um, and he wants to be buried in his World War II military uniform, which even that, you know, again, like we're talking about decisions that former presidents make that shape how we remember them. And to me, it's Eisenhower wanted to be remembered as a general. You know, he was president, but he's like, I mean, he, he was a soldier, right? I mean, he wanted to be, that's how he wanted to be. I'm like any other soldier, you give me the military grade casket. Um, and that's how Eisenhower saw himself, right? And so those little, those little details and decisions can tell you a lot about how a former president wants to be remembered. Do you feel that's, that you being someone who studied presidential times and the terms of these times, and the change that has been happening throughout the world. This population has grown, responsibilities have grown. Um, we've come across more of a accustomment of small amounts of violence happening in the United States when these presidential terms are changing. Do you feel that the presidency, just being one person in office, is still balanced, effective, and safe versus going into councils of some type? I mean, is the presidency itself dying and having hmm. a funeral? Hmm. That is a good question. Um, <laughs> is the presidency dying? Um, you know, certainly I think we've reached a new chapter in the evolution of the presidency because, you know, really, um, you know, I think what we're seeing, what I feel like we're seeing, at least from the American perspective, is that, uh, you know, this reverence for the office has dissipated. And, uh, you know, I think there's a number of different explanations. I also don't think it's just, you know, President Trump. Um, but I, I see there has been a decline in how people see the presidency, talk about the presidency, view the presidency, understand the presidency. And that's why I think studies like these are especially important 
Uh, and it's why centers for presidential studies are especially important. Because if we continue this downward trend of not maybe understanding or acknowledging the importance of or respecting the authority of an institution, well then those foundations erode. And then pretty quickly you have people that are, I mean, they, they're challenging everything. And you know, this is one of the core tenements within the United States Constitution. Uh, and so now we're getting to the level of, we're not just questioning the presidency, we're questioning the whole system. And despite everything this country has been through, despite a civil war that saw more than 750,000 people killed, we're still here. And so, you know, for anyone in this room who is, wants to learn more about the presidency, wants to learn more about the Constitution, wants to be a more informed citizen of this republic, history is the place to start. You go there and you're going to learn a lot more about why we are the way we are, why the presidency is the way it is, what we need to do to reverse these trends because it's alarming. It's frightening. Um, it really, I think, limits and restricts the powers uh, of a presidency. And some people say that's a good thing. It's like, well, I don't know. Maybe if you asked our enemies, they might like it too. <laughs> so, I mean, there's always a balancing act between these different things. And um, I don't know. There could be, there could be decay. Yeah, if I can jump in here and just reiterate why we chose our theme this year of empowered citizenship, it's because we feel like a lot of people just feel fatigued by the by the current system and by the rhetoric that's out there. And we've heard even from our opening speaker, Eric Liu and Victor Davis Hanson earlier this year that really the crux of our nation is us waking up every day and being the people that we want our nation to be comprised of, right? So. We can, we can feel like we are sort of um, subject to the world that we live in, or we can wake up every day and, you know, be kind to our neighbor and, you know, reserve our road rage for a different time and get to know the people around us and put our phones down and have an actual conversation and make those human connections that are actually what make our nation great, right? Um, but that's on all of us to wake up every day and do that. But we have that power within us. And so that's what we're really about trying to re-inspire this year is that we are in control of our own universes. And so what can we do with that? And we think it's a lot, quite frankly. So thank you for that. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. I think gentleman down here had a question. There's only one president uh, who's been buried in Washington, DC, and I'm aware of at least two that are across the Potomac and Arlington National Cemetery. Are there any more at Arlington? Uh, so you're referring to Woodrow Wilson, who was entombed at National Cathedral. Uh, and then we have John F. Kennedy and William Howard Taft, who are at Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, those are the only three within the immediate vicinity of DC. George Washington is down at Mount Vernon, which is about, I don't know, 20 miles or so from DC. Um, yeah, and you know, I think that would be another fascinating study. You know, William Howard Taft, he only served as president for one term, but then he goes on and he, and he serves as uh, Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. I mean, he's the only president to, uh, he served as president, but then goes on to serve in the most senior position, the, the top position in another branch of government. Um, and he also served a military governor of the Philippines. I mean, a remarkable life. And now people have just sort of boiled him down to he got stuck in a bathtub. Which isn't true. Which isn't true. Doesn't true. You know, you know it's not true because it's a good story. It's not true. <laughs> but I mean, again, it's like, well, how, how do we make those decisions? Like, how, how, why do we choose to remember that versus his service to the, to the country? I mean, it, is it just because it's easy? You know, we, it's easy to have like factoids and funny things and maybe, um, but you know, maybe, it, maybe that's again, it's just sort of a, a general, I don't know, a, 
we're not asking the right questions. And so uh, Taft is there. If you go to Arlington National Cemetery uh, and you're gonna visit President Kennedy, please, 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 you know, do us all a favor. Also stop by and see uh, William Howard Taft. Uh, he doesn't get nearly the same number of visitors as President Kennedy, um, but a remarkable man uh, who served the country in two key branches of our government. So I'm curious, early in your comments, you made a note that during President Lincoln's passing, a lot of people were afraid that there would be some major course change, return to enslavement, reconstruction would collapse, et cetera. Uh, and that didn't really happen. So I'm curious, in your review of all these other passings, are there any that really did represent a course change in the trajectory of the country, either socially, mm -hmm. politically, culturally, uh, or has the office always kind of held stronger than the occupant? Mm, excellent question. Um, you know, in the volume, anytime we talked about a president who died in office and then their successor came in, um, it seems like more often than not, they were very careful about making any kind of radical change. Oftentimes, presidents uh, would ask cabinet members to stay on, continue serving in the administration. They would continue to carry forward policies. You know, this is what Roosevelt does after McKinley's assassinated. And, um, but you know, those relationships only go so far. Uh, and I think Andrew Johnson's a great example where, you know, uh, things start to peter out with some of Lincoln's cabinet members, he creates enemies in Congress. And all of a sudden, um, you know, black Americans who's, they were, one of their biggest fears was that Andrew Johnson was not going to be a friend for civil rights. And it turns out, you know, they were right on that. Uh, Re-enslavement doesn't happen, but there's quite a few African Americans, including people like Frederick Douglass, who thought had Lincoln lived, things would have looked very differently uh, during Reconstruction. Now that's, we're only focusing on one group of people, but um, you know, if we're talking about maybe a more modern example, let's go with, uh, you know, Kennedy's assassination, right? Uh, you know, this is a, a very traumatic moment for all Americans. Um, and it's, it's amazing. You, there was a recent documentary on National Geographic uh, where they talked about, because it was the 60th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination, and they're showing clips of interviewing Americans in November 1963 after it happened. And they all have different, like everybody has a different explanation. Uh, somebody says it was fascist. Somebody says it was communist. Somebody says it was the Cubans. Somebody says it was the mob, uh, white supremacists. I mean, like you run the full spectrum of Americans trying to explain what happened to President Kennedy. And, uh, and here you have Lyndon Johnson who comes in as Kennedy's successor and he very effectively uses this to generate momentum toward a civil rights bill. Kennedy's bill had been stalled, wasn't going anywhere. Um, and part of his reason to visit Texas was to assuage some of those concerns in Texas so that you know, they could stay Democrat for 1964. And Johnson knows how to use the levers of government. He knows how to make the most out of a crisis. And he knows that by invoking Kennedy's name, he can put pressure on members of Congress to get things done. And what's really interesting about that is he frequently talks about Kennedy. He cites Kennedy all the time. After he wins election in 1964, he doesn't talk about Kennedy much at all. Johnson sees it as now he's been elected in his own right. He won a landslide over Barry Goldwater the American people have given him a mandate to put forward his ideas that become the great society. And Kennedy isn't really mentioned. It, the, now it's, it's like, now it's LBJ's time, right? Uh, but what's really fascinating though is in that chapter, African Americans tend to associate Kennedy with civil rights, not Johnson. And, uh, and in the immediate aftermath of the assassination, Many of them believe that because they thought Kennedy had been martyred, that he had been killed by a white supremacist or the KKK or some other terrorist group, when instead the Warren Commission comes out, they conclude that it was Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, and so again, it, it's very interesting to see that juxtaposition of a new president using sort of the passing of an old president to achieve a political end, uh, 
But then how Americans remember that is very different. Um, Matthew, I wonder if you might take a moment to talk about your work at the White House Historical Association. Sure. Um, I know you have a great new project that you're working on. And maybe um, I know we have a lot of students here, both from Grand Valley. And um, shout out to the AP Gov students from Byron Center High School. I know there's a few of you here. So maybe talk about some of the resources that sure. the association offers, where they can go for research and other things. Sure. So uh, I work for the White House Historical Association as the chief education officer. We were founded in 1961 at the request of First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy as a cooperating association with the National Park Service. So we are the private nonprofit partner to the White House and we've worked with every administration since the Kennedys. And a big part of our mission is to help promote the general understanding of the executive mansion as well as the people who live there and work there. Now, just out of curiosity, how many people purchase our official White House Christmas ornament? Uh, we have a few hands. Well, now you know, uh, and in fact, the last ornament, 2023's ornament, honored the 38th President of the mm -hmm. United States, Gerald Ford. So if you haven't gotten your Ford ornament yet, I highly suggest you do that. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, time is running out because pretty soon we will be unveiling the Carter ornament. Uh, but a big part of that is our, it's a big part of our fundraising, really. And uh, between that and then our own development team, uh, we fund our research, scholarship, uh, K through 12 education efforts. We do teacher training and PR opportunities. And then for students, you know, if you're interested in learning more about the White House, we have a wide variety of research collections on our website where we cover topics like uh, protest outside the White House, uh, African-Americans in the White House, the presidency, uh, the role of first lady, all these different things that you maybe come across uh, in say a, a government class uh, or an AP government class. You can learn more about it on our website, whitehousehistory.org. Uh, the final thing that I'll say is we're very excited because we are opening a new visitor experience in Washington, DC come September, 2024. Uh, it's called the People's House, a White House experience. We know that not everybody uh, gets to go tour the White House. Everybody makes their requests and not everybody gets in. And uh, we think that this history really belongs to all Americans uh, and all people should have the opportunity to learn more about the White House. And so we'll be opening this at 1700 Pennsylvania Avenue. And if you're interested in learning more about it, just go to thepeopleshouse.org and you'll learn more about the new experience. When a person become president, becomes president, does he or she have to sign, uh, make an agreement of some sort, stipulating what will, what will occur or, you know, at the time of their uh, death. Yes. So uh, when a new president comes into office, uh, one of the first things that they do is they create a funeral plan. Uh, they create a funeral plan and they will periodically revisit it during an administration. And then after leaving the White House, they will continue to revisit that plan because obviously the president's wishes or the first lady's wishes may change over time. And so I think uh, George H.W. Bush's funeral plan in total was about 211 pages. Uh, but I mean, it covered everything, all the logistics that are gonna be involved with uh, doing a service in Houston at St. Martin's Episcopal, uh, doing a service at National Cathedral, laying in state of the rotunda, the processions, uh, transporting the, the remains, uh, the train component, going back to College Station, the final burial, and then, of course, keeping in mind who are your invited guests for all these things. How do you differentiate who goes to which service? I think the Bushes did, uh, if you lived east of the Mississippi, you went to Washington. And if you lived west of the Mississippi, you came to Texas. So, I mean, you know, they, they come up with these, these solutions to these types of problems because capacity is always an issue. Uh, but, you know, part of the good news with that is, you know, now we have new technologies. You know, we have the Internet. Uh, we have live streaming, we have real-time uh, media capturing all of these things, we have social media. Uh, so there are all these different ways for people to participate and watch and witness what's happening without having to necessarily be in the room. Thank you. Well, friends, let's thank Matthew again for being with us tonight. <laughs>
Um, of course, we want to say thank you again to our friends at the Ford Presidential Museum and Library, without whom we could not have our program this evening. So thanks again to them. Um, a reminder, you, you will be receiving a post-event survey via email after this. Uh, we encourage you to fill it out. It's the only way that we can know how to be better. So please give your feedback. And, you know, don't be shy. Also, let us know if you enjoyed the evening. We like that, too. Um, we will have book sales and signing out in the lobby right after this, as well as some refreshments. So we hope you all engage in some community conversations. Talk about what you learned tonight. Talk about what you think it means to be an empowered citizen. And last but not least, we hope to see you all next Thursday for our Progressive Conservative Summit on the topic of constitutional reform. We will have Jeffrey Rosen here from the National Constitution Center, mm -hmm. and he will be the luncheon keynote on his new book, The Pursuit of Happiness. So with that, um, I bid you all a good evening and we'll see you again. Thanks. <laughs>